Good afternoon. You're watching the 35th edition of Tell It Like It Is, and my name is Kathy Benick. Today's show is different from our usual format in that it features a live debate between two Republican candidates running to represent District 9 in the New Hampshire Senate. With me today is Representative Ken Hawkins of Bedford and also Senator Andy Sanborn of Bedford. There's a third Republican who entered the race on the last day to file candidacy papers for the September 11th primary election, and he is Michael Kenney. He too was invited to participate, but declined when learning that candidates would not be provided with today's questions in advance. Now the purpose of an event like this is for candidates to be able to show their understanding of issues important to voters, the depth of their knowledge on the issues, and their ideas on solutions to pressing problems. It's not for them to come here and simply show up and give prepared and rehearsed answers to questions when I, that were asked in advance. Thus, I refuse to provide questions in advance to Mr. Kenny. There's also a Democratic candidate in the race, Attorney Lee Nyquist of New Bedford. He is unopposed in the primary election and is thus guaranteed a place on the November final election ballot. So consequently, he was not invited to participate here today, but he will be invited to participate in another event that will take place after the September primary. Representative Hawkins, Senator Sanborn, and Attorney Nyquist have all been guests on previous Tell It Like It Is shows, and all three shows are available for you to watch again or for the first time on the BCTV website at www.bedfordtv.com. Because those shows were taped prior to Mr. Kenny's last minute entry into the race, he was also invited to tape a similar show now, and he has declined. <coughs> Now, I won't waste precious debate time today to provide biographies on today's debate participants. You can learn that information by watching their Tell It Like It Is shows that are available on the BCTV website or by visiting each of the candidates' websites themselves. And Mr. Hawkins' website is www.kenhawkinsforstatesenate.com and Mr. Sanborn's website is www.andysanborn.com. The format for today's debate is a pretty simple one. Because both candidates here today are Republicans, they share many similar philosophies. So I decided to not have them rebut each other on every single question. Instead, after all the questions have been asked and all of the answers given, each candidate will be given ample time to rebut any comments made by his opponent and to offer his alternative position. Both candidates will be asked the same questions and will have two minutes to answer each question. A coin toss was held just before we went live today to determine who would be the first respondent to the first question. The winner of the coin toss then had the option to elect that his opponent instead be first. I arbitrarily made the decision to assign the heads or tails status to each candidate based on the alphabetical order of his last name. Thus, Mr. Hawkins was assigned heads, Mr. Sanborn was assigned tails. The winner of the coin, first coin toss was Andy Sanborn, and Mr. Sanborn has elected to be the first to answer the first question. With each subsequent question, we'll reverse the order of who answers first. Now, people's opinions differ as to whether it's more favorable to be the first or the last in giving a final rebuttal and closing statement. So a second coin toss was held to have fate determine who will be the first to give his rebuttal. The winner must accept that position. And the result of that coin toss was that Andy Sanborn will deliver his rebuttal first. Rebuttal time is to be used only to address issues already discussed or, if time remains, to insert a thought on some other vital subject. Now, there will be a separation between that and when each candidate will be asked to make his final comments, to ask for your vote and to tell you why he deserves it. In a final twist of fate to today's debate, I'm reversing the order in which closing statements will be offered from the order of their rebuttal. Thus, Ken will speak first, and Andy will be the last to speak. Now, we do have a small in-studio audience today. I'll ask that they refrain from any speaking or audible reactions throughout the debate, and please turn off all cell phones. So, with that, gentlemen, fire up your engines, and let's begin this debate. <laughs> Welcome to both of you, and thank you for being here. Okay, first question. 
Many people in New Hampshire take very, very seriously their Second Amendment right to bear arms. And over the past few months, we've seen increasing acts of violence involving guns, violence that has resulted in the death of yet another New Hampshire police officer, and serious injury to several others. We've also seen some shocking situations of murder and suicide by gunshot, with three deaths as recently as last week in Salem. Do you see a need for changes to New Hampshire gun laws? And please explain your reasoning. Hey, Kathy, first, thank you so much for having me today. And Ken, thanks for coming in. All the staff at BCTV, thanks so much for your hard work today for this program. And everyone listening out there today, again, thanks so much for tuning in to us. You know, our Second Amendment rights, to me, is one of the most important rights that we have. Uh, I am a strong supporter of our Second Amendment rights. I am a member of the NRA, and it's a constitutional provision that you know, helps to define everything that makes us America, because as some would say, without the second, you couldn't have the first or any other provision of it. You know, it's a tragedy to see out there that, that there's been some violence, but we have to remember that it was bad people doing bad things, you know, to suggest that having guns or being a gu having a gun itself commit the crime would make the same suggestion that, that a pencil makes me a bad speller. You know, again, it's, it's truly a tragedy that people have gotten hurt. And I think we also need to remember, as I said earlier, bad people doing bad things shouldn't necessarily allow us to restrict our gun rights. And frankly, I, I would not support uh, making our gun rights more restrictive. You know, we've had a number of conversations about that in the legislature this year from a, a wide variety of topics. It's an issue that's been debated on a very regular basis. And the people of New Hampshire have been very clear on both parties and independents, libertarians, Republicans, and Democrats. We believe in our constitutional right. We believe in our ability to, to, possess, to, to possess guns and support the Second Amendment. You know, as a, as a lifelong active outdoor person with my wife and I hunting, fishing, hiking, enjoying everything that New Hampshire has to offer, uh, it's, it's, it's a right that we have that I will defend um, uh, fully. Thank you very much. Mr. Harkins. Thank you, Kathy. Thank you, BCTV, for having us. Thank you, Andy, for taking part in the debate. Uh, I, too, am a very, very good supporter of the Second Amendment. Uh, I also support constitutional carry. I think the problem that we have is we have a lot of activists that are trying to restrict gun tr guns in the, to the public. Uh, as we move forward, every time you try to take a gun away from someone and when we have a problem like this, all that happens is the criminals are the only ones that wind up with guns. I fought very much so in the, in the state house, in the, in the uh, house this time, so that we could protect ourselves. We didn't have to f take flight if someone was threatening our lives. What good is it to, do, to you or to me if someone comes after me and I can't protect myself? Those are the things that we need to keep our control over so that we have that right. As long as we have folk that want to restrict ownership, we're still going to have those types of problems. So yes, I am a very, very, very large supporter of the Second Amendment. And if you look at my voting record over 10 years, I think you'll find out that I've stuck to that battle. Thank you. Thank you. OK, next question. And you'll be answering this first, Ken. In recent weeks, we have learned of widespread abuse of electronic benefit transfer cards for such things as cigarette and liquor purchases, for cash at places like casinos, head shops, and adult entertainment venues, and even in out-of-state locations like Florida and the Virgin Islands. Now, obviously, state supervision of card use has been severely lacking. Yet, we have heard Terry Smith, head of the New Hampshire HHS Division of Family Assistance Program, claim on TV and in interviews that he needs a bigger infrastructure, more staff, more money, and bigger travel budgets to better monitor the program. What do you say about this? Uh, I don't agree with that. I think uh, people are taking advantage of the taxpayers when they can take an EBT card, go to get uh, cash out of an ATM, and then get down the street and buy liquor, uh, cigarettes, porn, whatever they want to spend that money on. In years past, we had uh, food stamps. You could take them to the grocery store and they were only valid on certain products. What's happened is the federal government is part of their overreach is saying, okay, here, we're gonna make it easier for folks to take advantage and take advantage of the taxpayers 
by going out and using these items. I don't agree that it's going to require a lot of work and a lot of infrastructure and a lot of people in order to get a handle on this. This is taxpayer dollars. This is not money that comes out of the air. We have to figure out a way to rein some of this in. I think the first step that we need to take, and we've started to take it from in the, in the House of Representatives, is to go out and look at all of the folks that are receiving these benefits. We found a number of people, when they ran through a database from a private company, people didn't even live in the state. People have been dead for five or ten years. So I think those are the things that we need to really start to look at. But yes, EBT cards and the whole process is way, way out of control. Thank you. Andy? Thank you, ma'am. You know, there's no question that the challenges we're seeing with the EBT cards and the straight out fraud of your tax dollars highlights a couple of real issues. The biggest issue it highlights is that government continues to be ill-equipped to deal with so many of the programs that it's running today. You know, all of us believe that we have an obligation to help those who are most in need. And as Ronald Reagan once said, it's about helping people get up onto their feet, not up off of their feet. You know, no one promised everyone a hammock. You know, the abuses that we're seeing in the EBT cards comes from two things. Obviously, there are specific people that are abusing the system. It's not everyone. Sure, it's a small percentage, but we need to truly work to make sure that if people are receiving assistance from the government, that it's the right type of assistance for the right type of program. Now, as it specifically relates to the government itself, and when I started this conversation about, it, it clearly demonstrates that our government is ill-equipped to handle the requirements technologically of the 21st century. On one hand, you would think it'd be relatively easy, but in New Hampshire today, you know, we still have state agencies that don't have the technology to accept charge cards. Most of the forms that we talk about in using government and how we interact with people, you can't even fill them out online like you would with, with eBay or with Amazon.com. Beyond question, when we talk about our need to reform government and make it answer to the people and make it more frugal with our tax dollars, we need to create a working structure or an infrastructure technologically that can really help ma monitor and manage these types of programs to ensure there is no fraud. And until we do that, until we recognize the fact that we're doing so many programs and we need to talk about prioritizing them, until we can make it work, until we can have the systems in place, we're gonna see this fraud. And that's one of the things I've worked so hard on as a state senator is to help make these types of corrections in our system. Thank you, Andy. Okay, next question, and then this will be to you first. Thank you, ma'am. A growing number of people believe that it's time to address factors that essentially weaken the power of the governor to forward his or hers promised agenda and to make binding decisions. New Hampshire governors basically inherit the key people like commissioners and the attorney general and can only make appointments when their terms expire, and then those appointments can be vetoed by the governor's council. Other states have instead have appointments that run concurrently with the governor's term, thus allowing each new governor the opportunity to put in place his own total team. And this seems to work best when the governor's term is a four-year one, not two years like in New Hampshire. So how do you feel about four-year terms for the governor and new governors being able to appoint the members of their new administration and what needs to be done to remove the ability of the governor's council to interfere with that whole process? Well, Kath, you know, that's a great question. It's obviously very, very complex. As a state senator, we debated this strongly in the Senate, and I actually talked in depth about creating a proposal and legislation to allow our governor, and frankly, I hope our next governor is Ovid or Kevin. They're both personal friends of mine, and they'll, either one of them will do a great job. I feel very strongly that the governor of a state is the CEO. They're the person in charge. I believe they should have the right and the power by which to bring in their management team, because if anyone's ever run a company, they fully understand how can you manage a large, complex organization if you can't have your team with you. So I had legislation that we talked about again in detail to allow a governor to 
uh, bring in his group of people. Now, if a governor makes a decision in recognizing that agency heads should be employees at will of the governor, then if the governor feels they're not doing the appropriate job, they should have the right to replace them. But I defer back to the executive council and would like to see it kept in place and still make the requirement that any new appointment would have to go through, through the executive council, because that would provide a check <laughs> and a balance. On the final part of it, relative to the two-year versus the four-year, you know, it's been hotly debated and contested for some time. You know, even though I was a state senator and I'm running for the state senate again, I think, fr frankly, quite often we have too many politicians who are in office for way too long. So I'm not a guy that would recommend extending anyone's career. I think just like our forefathers had always said to us, people have, a, have an obligation to perform their public service. They need to get in, help solve problems in our state, and then go home. So frankly, I wouldn't support extending any politician's time in office. Thank you. Thank you. Ken? Um, thank you, Kathy. Um, a portion of that I agree with, a portion of it I don't. I, I agree a two-year term for the, for the governor. Uh, if you have a bad governor, you don't want him there for four years. We have the ability in this state to elect every one of our state officials, be it state legislature, Senate, House, governor, executive council, county offices, every two years. It keeps everybody on their toes. It makes them report to the public. Um, I have a problem sometimes in, in coordinating the terms of, of, of appointees with the governor. Uh, you lose a lot of historical knowledge. We have had a number of folk come in that have been appointed by the governors, and it, especially in, in this last session, uh, we've had three or four commissioners have to resign because of the problems they had. If we give the governor that unchecked power to match his term, we're running into a whole bunch of problems because now I'm going to appoint somebody as governor. My term is two years. That person only has a job for two years. Am I going to get a quality person to come in and do that? I don't know. The way it works today, they get a five-year term. I think it works well. I agree the executive council needs to have the power over those appointees. They really do put the check and balance into the system. The problem, like I said, is, is that if we're appointing people for two years, I don't think we're going to find people to come and take the job. Thank you. Ken, you'll be answering this one first. New Hampshire voters in a few weeks will vote on a constitutional amendment that, if passed, will ban the imposition of a personal income tax on New Hampshire residents. Groups like the New Hampshire Fiscal Policy Institute and the American Federation of Teachers oppose the ban. Some people say that it would increase the tax burden on business. Both of you oppose broad-based taxes, like an income tax and a sales tax. Both of you believe that business taxes must be lowered, not increased. Please tell us how state government can be financed with no new taxes, no tax increases, and without more reliance on property taxes. And please be specific. Um, I agree. I voted for the constitutional amendment that we're going to have on the ballot to, do, to say you can never have an income tax. The problem we've had in other states is New Jersey, Connecticut, you can name the state. They promised to lower the property taxes if, in fact, they would pass an income tax. They passed an income tax. Guess what? Their property tax pays, their property taxes are now higher than they were before they passed the income tax. Anytime you give government more money, they're going to figure out a way to spend it. My credo since I've started running 10 years ago is we don't have a revenue problem, we've got a spending problem. We have to figure out how to make government more efficient. I was an assistant controller in my past life, and one of my jobs was to go around the company and look at departments and make them more efficient. Uh, as, we, as I did that, once we got them running correctly and more efficient, we go out and hire somebody to come in and run on a day-to-day -day basis. The goal with that is to make the company more profitable and also to make it run smoother. We have to do that in state government. We have a number of agencies up there that I hate to say are running amok, but we do not look from a common sense standpoint to come up with resolutions, solutions to problems that we have up there. I, to me, that's what we have to look at. We have to look at consolidating things. We have to look at doing away with some of the bureaucracy. Those are the things that I think solves the problem, not going out and trying to find new revenue. The Democrats did that four years ago and raised the taxes 28 times. 
we wound up and started this term with an $800 million deficit that we were able to balance the budget and reduce spending in the State House. Thank you. Andy. Thank you, Castro. <laughs> That's a great question. You know, as a state senator, I was known as one of the most, if not the most, frugal senator that we have in the state of New Hampshire. Not only do I oppose a sales or an income tax, then frankly all Republicans tend to say that. But I think the true medal of them is do they still vote for additional tax increases and fine increases and penalties and assessments? And that's a big part where you see the difference in some of us. I admit I'm a traditional New Hampshire Yankee conservative, intend to be frugal, have not, nor will I ever vote for any tax increases, broad-based tax, or fee, fines, penalties, taxes, or assessments. You know, we have to remember that just you know, 10 years ago when Mr. Hawkins indicated he was in, he was in the State House, we had a budget of $6.8 billion with 1.3 million people living here. It, over the past 10 years, it exploded to $11.7 billion with no change at all in the number of people that did live here. It clearly shows that those in politics continue to be poor with your tax dollars. They're not working efficiencies. They're not trying to be good with your money. And I feel very strongly when we talk about do we have a revenue problem or a spending problem, it's worse than that. We have a waste problem. Our government is truly wasting your dollars. And that's what I went there to try and correct. You know, one of my pieces of legislation as a state senator was Senate Bill 92, which is trying to bring some efficiencies to our government. And if I can lucky enough to get your support and get reelected, I'm going to go back in and bring a piece of legislation by itself that will save our budget over $300 million and do nothing but make services and make a better efficient government to respond to your needs. And if we can find savings like that, I personally believe very strongly it needs to go back right towards property tax relief or other tax relief to the people who are struggling so hard today to make ends meet. So it's about reforming, it's about modernizing, it's about being good with your tax dollars. Thank you. Andy, you're also first on this question. During the 2012 legislative session, we saw a lively battle over whether power should be restored to the legislature to determine state funding for public education. Another big education battle was over school choice. Legislation which was passed was vetoed by the governor and then stayed in place when legislators overrode the veto. Where were you on these issues and what do you believe will be the major educational issues for legislators coming up in the 2013 session? Thanks, Kathy, it's a great question. You know, I'm known as also as a center that really believes in our families believe strongly in, in ensuring great education. I'm on the President's Advisory Board for New England College in Henniker and was just appointed to be the Dean's Advisory Committee for Chief Justice Broderick up at UNH Law. Education is really important to me. It's my, and having two members of my family who have been in the system, I think I've got a good working knowledge to it. But I believe education starts at home. It starts with parents. It starts with your local community having the right and the ability to dictate the future of their children. That's what's a, a, a real challenge to us today. I'm a strong believer in school choice. I'm a strong believer in charter schools. I believe parents have that right, or should have that right, to be able to help direct their kids' future and their education needs. Not every kid can work in public schools. You know, not all public schools are good and not all of them are bad. But we need to provide the competitiveness, we need to provide the flexibility to ensure that every child gets that use. You know, one of the things I'm most proud at is we had my office mate, Senator Jim Forsyth, brought Senate Bill 372, which is a new scholarship program to truly help people of all economic levels try and allow parents to give them some scholarships and some ability to go find the school of their choice. I think it's incredibly important. I think it's what we'll keep working on. On the constitutional amendment itself, you know, something we've been struggling with for a long, long time, 1987. The legislature, in my personal belief, should be able to help dictate what happens with our educational system. I don't believe the Supreme Court has the right to weigh in on policy issues. You know, it was disappointing that we weren't able to get it passed and haven't, but I know it's probably going to be one of our biggest issues next year, is how do we solve that ability to help those that need it, and so we can target, the, uh, target appropriately. Thank you so much. Thank you. Ken? Uh, thank you, Kathy. Uh, yes, I, su I supported uh, the constitutional amendment to get the courts out of the, the school funding issue. Uh, it, it, it's become a problem ever since they found the word cherish in the Constitution. The courts should not be telling us how to do it. We should be able to, in the legislature, target aid to communities that need it. I can tell you the other problem with school funding is Bedford loses 
probably $5 million a year because the, the school funding formula that's there today takes into account the number of students that were here before we had a high school. Before we had a high school, we lost probably 20-something percent of our students to St. Paul's, Trinity, Bishop Girton, et cetera, all the private schools. Since we built a high school, they've all come back. Well, the state says, well, we're sorry. You, your, but your school funding can't go up by more than 5%. So we're being penalized for that. That's an issue that we need to take to, to, the, to the state house. Uh, I supported the business tax credit to give scholarships. Uh, that's going to go a long way to help some of the uh, students that can't afford to go to college go to college. I've been a strong supporter of charter schools since they first came out. We've had a couple people here in town that have started them and I was more than happy to help them out. Uh, I think homeschooling is it's fantastic. Uh, the parents are the ones that know the best of how to bring their, their children up. They bring the right values to their children. Those are the things that we need to do. The state has overreached because we have too many people with too many hands in the pot. The State Board of Education is out of control with the, all of the mandates that they're passing down to us, be it core curriculum, be it you have to teach this subject, you have to give all these other things. We need to go back to read and write and arithmetic. Thank you. Thank you. With the U.S. Supreme Court's decision on the Affordable Care Act, or Obamacare, New Hampshire will now have several issues to face. A feature of Obamacare is that it will expand Medicaid eligibility, something that could add up to 50,000 new people to New Hampshire Medicaid at a cost some say will cost as much as $1.76 billion over the next seven to 10 years. Earlier this year, though, the Supreme Court said that states cannot be forced to expand Medicaid. What options do you perceive that the state legislature must now explore to deal with yet another major health care issue? Ken? Um, thank you, Kathy. Uh, I do not support Obamacare. I'm hoping that we have a governor that gets reelected that will finally get the attorney general to go after it and take us out of the system. I'm hoping we elect President Romney, who has promised that he would get rid of it when he got into office. I hope we can elect enough U.S. Senators to do the same thing. Uh, all it is is, is a, a, a tax on everyone in the country. Uh, President Obama says it's not a tax, it's a mandate. The Supreme Court said it's not a mandate, it's a tax. We have to figure out a way to get out of that. That not only increased our Medicaid costs as we go forward because they're increasing the, the eligibility by 50 percent, uh, we have a, a, a something in right now to request a waiver. That was the one thing that they they've said the Supreme Court said you could do. You could have a waiver for each state. We have requested that waiver. I don't know where that's going to go. Uh, one of the other things that we need to think about is, is all of the things that they're forcing down on people uh, for the Catholic Church, the Catholic schools. Now you have to have a part of your insurance plan, uh, contraception, all of the things that go against people's religion. One of the things they said, well, you don't have to pay for it as a company or the church or whatever. The insurance company is going to pay for it. Well, that's another mandate, and who winds up paying for it? We wind up paying for it in our premiums because the insurance companies still have to have the outlays without having the money coming in for those mandates. So yes, I think we've got a, a, a real big problem coming down the road with the whole Obamacare and socialistic medicine. Thank you. Andy? Thank you, ma'am. You know, as a good Irish Catholic boy, um, you know, this whole attack on our religion is really, really bothering me. And as a business owner, every time I hear someone call it the Affordable Care Act, I'm still trying to find out where it's affordable because my health insurance has gone up 30% last year, 28% the year before. It's out of control. It's arguably the largest issue we have in our state. As state senator, I recognize this as a small business owner and one of the only small business owners in our state that's in the state Senate and running for re-election to the state Senate. I can't tell you how high of a priority this is. You know, I tried to bring legislation forth last year and we've got most of the way there, which is why I'm asking your support to come back. It was an amendment I put on to Senate Bill 150. 20 years ago when I started my first company, there were 23 different healthcare providers competing for my trust in my business. 
today solely as a result of legislative action by these long-term established politicians, they've whittled that down to two. We have no fair, free market. We have no competition. My legislation, Senate Bill 150, would knock those walls back down and allow us to go out and compete for insurance just like we do today with our car insurance, just like we do today with our homeowner's insurance. There's no reason that our health insurance can't be the same way competitively. And if we do that, it will really help knock down costs. In addition to that, in the Senate, again, we, we really worked on managed Medicaid, help bring down costs of government financed health care. You know, it's a very complex issue. Cost, competitiveness, good service, those are all important. But we can't forget about the fact that we have one of the healthiest populations of people in America right here in New Hampshire, and yet still one of the oldest on average, but yet our health care costs are the highest. There is so much we can do to reduce our health care costs on and above Obamacare, which I completely do not support. And if you're, I'm lucky enough to get reelected, we will reduce your health care costs and it'll be one of my biggest priorities. Thank you. The issue of expanded gambling will remain front and center in New Hampshire. Both of you have previously expressed concerns with the state opening the door for such. Please outline your concerns and tell us what the legislature would need to do to adequately address those concerns in order for you to support expanded gambling. And Andy? Thank you, ma'am. Uh, it's a great question, Kathy. I'm not sure it's something we ever are going to solve. You know, there are so many structural mechanical challenges with them. You know, we talk about some of the social issues and concerns about drugs and, and crime and stuff like that. But even beyond that, when we just talk the sheer finance and the mechanics, my challenges are so many. Why is it that the state of New Hampshire feel it leaves to that it can be in a position to, to pick a specific winner or a spe specific loser? That's not free market. You know, there are many other states around America that opened up the gambling and said, you know, we'll bid it out by the machine or we'll bid it out by the location. So I think we start right from the top and suggest that the state of New Hampshire is trying to specifically pick who wins and who loses. You know, that just isn't the New Hampshire way. On top of that, I'm also truly concerned about the long-term aspects. Sure, the first year would see this great windfill where we might get 30 or $50 million of money up front, but what happens in year two, three, four, or five? What happens when, when the operators of those casinos come back and talk about how difficult their pressures are and how to force the take down and force the taxes down? What happens in year two or year three when we don't get that big $50 million hit up front? At the end of the day, they continue to talk that gambling will bring our state about $30 million. You know, two years ago, we had to close a $900 million budget deficit. $30 million isn't going to solve our problem. Not to mention the fact, I truly don't believe that our state needs any more money. It needs to be spending your tax dollars much wiser. As I said, mentioned earlier in this debate, just my Senate Bill 92 will save our state $300 million without even having that policy discussion of what we should be doing and where our priorities are. There is so much to be saved in our state government, which should go back again to help local property taxes and help cut our taxes overall. You know, gambling, it just isn't the solution for New Hampshire. Thank you. Yes, ma'am. Ken? Thank you, Kathy. Um, we've had this discussion since I've been in Concord for 10 years, probably five or six times. Uh, I have voted against gambling every time. Uh, I don't agree with it. I think the problem that we have in New Hampshire is we're chasing revenues. If you look at Connecticut, when they passed and Foxwood first started out, they were getting $25 million a month into the state treasury. Right now they're getting about five to $10 million a month. It just takes away the, the, the money out of the average person's pocketbook and gives it to the state government to spend. And again, we've talked about it before, the state government does not need any more money. Not only that, we now have Boston and, and Massachusetts passing all those casinos that are within a half an hour of our border. We're not going to get the money that people are projecting we're going to get here. We also have the social issues. How do you take care of the problem gambler? How do you take care of the alcoholic? How do you take care of the, the drug dealer that's robbing people to get drug money to go gamble to, drive more, but to buy more drugs. So no, I don't think that gambling fits into our New Hampshire uh, lifestyle. It doesn't fit in with the New Hampshire advantage. So no, I, I would, I've never voted for a gambling and I wouldn't in the future. Thank you. You've both been strong advocates for public employee pension reform. Please explain 
What has already been done to reduce the $4.2 billion unfunded liability? And what you believe that the legislature still needs to address on this? And Ken, you're first. Uh, thank you, Kathy. Thank you. Um, we haven't done anything uh, to address the issue. Uh, we've picked around the edges. The unfunded liability is still $4.2 billion uh, in going up. Uh, this year our returns were 0.7% instead of 7.5. I've been fighting for pension reform for 10 years. Uh, I'm the acknowledged leader at the State House on pension reform. As I said, we've nibbled around the edges. We need to take a drastic step to rein in excess benefits that we're not getting the money to pay. We need to move forward and get people to some sort of a 401k type system, uh, just like out in the average business or the average person out on the street. Uh, as, as the investment returns are not coming in, people are betting that as we get down the road, that somehow, some way, uh, we're going to win the lottery, and all of this is going to come forward. Uh, what we need to do is address the basic, basic problems that are taking place, and that is the excess benefits promised and not enough money coming in. The employer contributions, which is your local property taxpayers, has gone from 3% of the salaries of the workers to up to 22%. You can see what that does to a town's budget. I know in Bedford, in a school district last year, just the, the small increase that went, went through last year was an extra million and a half dollars. That's 50 cents on your tax base here in Bedford. We have to stop the money going out of that system. We have to address it. Thank you. Andy? Thank you, sir. Thanks so much. You know, we all recognize it's kind of like the elephant in the back of the room no one wants to talk about. Think about the fact that we're spending $5 billion a year in our state budget, and we have that much on top of that, which sits back there as an unfunded liability to try and make sure we cover the promises of the past. And therein lies one of the challenges that we have. Our state made a promise to people, and we can argue about when, where, when, and how much, but that's one of the challenges we have today. You know, there's no question that most, in fact, all business owners back into the mid 80s recognized that these, you know, defined benefit plans did not work and would not be the, the answer to our future. So we're stuck today with just mostly our municipalities and some large unions still demanding this defined benefit when there just isn't the money to have. It's as Kenny says, it's complex. It's been going on for a long time. And our legislature has really dug us into a pretty big hole and we're all right, it's time to get us out of it. For me, one of my major concerns today isn't even just the whole, it's how we're coming, coming out of it. You know, getting only a 0.7% return last year. You know, a lot of people out there, a lot of you listening today have retirement accounts. I'm sure very, very few of you only saw returns at that level. I question what's the board doing. I question what are the people who the investors are doing when, again, legislatively, we're telling everyone these funds should be receiving a 7.5% return. Now, frankly, I don't think anyone listening today is getting a 7.5% return, but I think they're probably getting more than 0.07. So not only do we have this mechanical challenge of the, the money itself and how it's being invested and reinvested in the returns, but we have the structural decision of how we're going to take care, both take care of the promises of the people who are vested, because we do have to do that. But there's no question, we need, to, we need to convert to a defined contribution plan so we can move this state forward. Thank you. Andy, you'll be first on this one. Both of you have previously stated some opposition to commuter rail being extended into New Hampshire as far north as Concord due to the almost inevitable need for taxpayer subsidy for its operation. Given the probability that passenger fares will not ever be able to cover operational costs, what other factors would make you <laughs> reconsider opposition to the expansion of commuter rail into New Hampshire? You know, I, I think it's a pretty simple question. Expanded rail in your tax dollars. If it can't pay for itself, we shouldn't be doing it. So many of our challenges today is we have a government that continues to run amok and make promise upon promise of things it should do. It's not prioritizing, it continues just to try and find more ways to spend your money. You know, I've traveled through Europe and I love going there, it's a wonderful time. My wife Lori went to school in England and we spent some time traveling the Eurail. It would be great, 
but it has to be great in the sense that it has to be self-funded. It has to pay for itself. Now, ironically, the legislature has been talking about this for some time. And I think a part that we miss is any community that wants to, like Nashville, has been a pretty big debate as to whether or not they want to bring in their own rail. They have that ability to do it if they so want to. But I just cannot see, nor can I support, using state dollars to put money into an investment that will never return. Essentially, it will turn itself into yet another retirement program where the state will be putting money into it forever and it's never going to pay for itself. There are so many things we need to consider. Now, we also know that our roads and transportation are inc also incredibly important. So any money that goes into roads will go away, I'm sorry, that will go in the, into rail will go away from roads. You know, look, we've been trying to widen our 93 for as long as I can remember. We're finally starting to make some action on that, and I support that. I believe 93 needs to be four lanes from Massachusetts to Manchester, and then I need, believe it needs to be three lanes from Manchester to Tilton. I don't want to see us take our eye off that ball. I don't want to see us take our eye off the, the true infrastructure projects that we have today about fixing our roads that need repair, about fixing our bridges that need repair, and about expanding the road infrastructure first before we can consider anything that frankly just won't have a payback. Thank you. Ken? Um, thank you, Kathy. Uh, commuter rail doesn't work. Um, if you just read the papers last week, Amtrak had a $50 million loss on catering. I mean, they farmed it out to someone to do the catering. I don't understand how they can lose money when they've assigned it to another company to run. Uh, it, it eats up everybody's dollars. Uh, the, the, the one from Portland to Boston is costing a lot of money to the taxpayers of Maine and Massachusetts and even over on the seacoast. So I don't know how commuter rail ever, ever becomes profitable. There are very few, there's a couple that work very well, the New York to Washington, D.C. That one works. They charge good uh, fares and they're full. That's what it takes. If it can be done, do it. But don't subsidize it with state tax dollars. I mean, everybody talks about commuter rail. We had commuter rail here. I can remember back in the 70s when my children were five, six years old, we lived in Merrimack at that time before we moved to Bedford. We then, they had a commuter rail. We said, let's take them to Boston for the day. We picked up the train station of Merrimack, went down through Nashua, went to Boston, spent the day at the museums. It was fine, but they couldn't support it. So yes, New Hampshire has tried this before, and it hasn't worked. Why are we going to go back and re try to redo everything all over again and find out we have the same problems? So no, I, I'm been adamant against commuter rail for the 10 years that I've been in the State House. Thank you. Okay, gentlemen, we need to transition now to stay within our one hour time frame. So it will now be time for your rebuttal statements. As determined by the pre-airtime coin toss, Mr. Sanborn, you will go first. You will each have four minutes to rebut any comments made by your opponent and to expand your own comment on the subject. Please use your time wisely by primarily staying with today's topics or on any other issue that you deem as vital should you have some time left. Um, you will be given additional time for your closing statement, so please do not use this time to ask for the vote. Mr. Sanborn, you may begin. Kathy, again, thank you, thank you, thank you so much, and Ken, thanks. You know, we've talked about a lot of issues today, and it's just honestly a smattering of some of the challenges that are facing our state. You know, I, I believe when I came into the Senate, when we started dealing with some of these issues, it takes a lot of that energy and a lot of that knowledge on a broad, broad width of things to talk about. You know, as, as it comes specifically to, you know, what we need to do to cure our problems, most of what we talked about really had to do with expenses, really had to do with specific programs. You know, all of us remember 20 years ago when New Hampshire was the place that businesses wanted to be. We were that place up on the shining hill. It was because we had a smaller, more efficient government. As we've talked about with these programs today, from one end to the other, there seems to be a real common theme. Our government's become too big, too broad, too bold. It's no longer focusing on its core services. You know, every time we talk about one of these programs between the EBT card and what we're going to do about rail and what we do about education and what we do about health care, we need to recognize that each one of these individually st runs the risk of really bankrupting our state. We need to f find some people to get in there and understand them and really go back and focus on prioritizing people's money, prioritizing your tax dollars, be it allowing parents 
that ability to send their kid to their, the school of their choice, or recognizing that the future of our state comes from, by a very large degree, tourism. So we have to expand and finish our roads way before we consider talking about rail. You know, it's those traditional New Hampshire Yankee values that I really believe our state and the politicians in our state have really walked away from. And that raises us to these types of questions as to where should we spend money and how much money should we spend in year after year after year. It just seems like it becomes more. So be it a constitutional amendment so we can target aid to specific communities, be it focusing on transportation as opposed to not focusing on rail, be it focusing in something we haven't talked a lot about today, which I think is exceptionally important, almost as important as our health care issue is, let's, we should be talking about regulation and the burden that government continues to put on the small business owners. You know, I have a close friend of mine that owns a sand pit. The guy shovels dirt in the back of your pickup truck. It's a very small company. He only does about a million dollars a year in business. But today he has 17 separate regulatory authorities at the federal, state, county, and local level overseeing his business. You know, so much of the challenges we have today come down to the fact that our government is no longer rewarding good behavior. It's just assuming everyone's bad and fee, fine, penalizing, and assessing them for that. We need to have that cultural shift in how our government operates. And that comes from picking the right legislators. Then we can start looking at the programs and begin to really prioritize about where government should be and what it should be doing. You know, we, we talked earlier in this conversation about does the state need more revenue and where will it come from if we don't raise taxes or put in a broad-based tax? Again, I'm completely against all of that. I don't want to support a broad-based taxes or small taxes. What I do want to do is get our government out of the way so we can allow the business community to grow and expand and just you know, a 20% increase in our business activity would raise our state $300 million in additional revenue. So we don't need taxes, we just need to let companies be companies. And it's the fact that our government continues to stand in the way on all of these issues we talked about today, every one of them has turned into a discussion about how government is, is impeding progress, how it's holding your money, how it's spending it poorly. That really needs to be the focus of, our, of what our future is. Getting government back to respect you as a person and respect your tax dollars, and that's what we'll work on. Thank you, Andy. And Mr. Harkins. Thank you, Kathy. Um, one of the things we have to look at is the efficiency in state government. In 2010, I served on a study committee just looking at trying to figure out how we could make government more efficient. The first place we looked was, happened to be judiciary. Well, the judiciary had four different accounts payable and four different accounts receivable departments. If you got a speeding ticket, you paid one department. If you get a divorce, you pay an alimony, you paid a different one. If your wages are garnished, you paid another one. It went on and on. We said, this is kind of stupid. We sat down and said, all right, let's consolidate them all in one department. And when we did, we saved a million and a half dollars. Those are the types of things of thinking outside the box and being coming from a business world that we can do up there at the state house. The problem that we have is the entrenched folk that sit in the agencies and said, oh, these elected officials are only gonna be here for two years and they're gonna be gone. We don't have to listen to them at all. That continually, continually happens. We have a problem with our roads and our infrastructure. What happens? We have a gas tax. What's it supposed to do? It's supposed to fix the roads. It goes into the highway fund. The highway fund continually gets robbed to buy state police cruisers, to buy other things for the Department of Safety. That's wrong. Those are the places that we can save money. I think that as we continue to go forward to get back to the New Hampshire advantage, we have to figure out enticements to get businesses to move here. We just had a great new business come to Rochester, Albany International. They're going to be hiring three to 400 new people, and they're good, high-paying jobs. We got them here to come here because we're willing to work with the community college to help develop programs to train the people to do these types of jobs. The community college system is a great system that we have in this state. It does a fantastic job up in the Upper Valley, Hanover, Lebanon, in training machine shops, CNC people, those type things. The one in Manchester does a great job working with CNC controllers, working with GE. GE is dying to hire people to run those machines in hooks at making jet engines $90,000 a year. And they can't hire them. They can't find qualified people. Those are the types of things I think that we need to start to look at 
And that's the, the things that, as we move forward, gets us back to that New Hampshire advantage. Somehow, some way, we've lost track of what's going on, and everybody wants something for free from the government. We really have to address those issues. Thank you. Thank you. Well, as I look at the clock, I see that we have a little extra time. So with that, um, we will, or I will arbitrarily decide that you're getting a little <laughs> extra time for your closing statement. So, gentlemen, you'll now have three minutes each to tell voters why they should vote for you. And using reverse order from the rebuttal order, Ken Hawkins, please begin your three-minute closing statement now. Um, thank you, Kathy. Thank you, Andy. Thank you, BCTV, for having us. Um, I'm asking for your vote on September 11th. Uh, I was born in Plymouth, New Hampshire. Uh, lived here in Bedford since 1978. Joyce and I have been married for 44 years. We have two children, five, uh, five grandchildren. They live close enough that uh, Joyce gets to get on babysit in Kittery in Newton, Mass. every couple of weeks. Uh, she taught school here for 22 years. I've been very involved in the community, in the men's club, uh, Bedford Off Broadway, uh, American Legion. I'm a Marine Corps veteran. I served on the State Veterans Advisory Committee for four years, making sure uh, we're trying to get the benefits to the veterans that they deserve. One of the things we'd like to see done is to have a full service hospital up there. One of the, I was in Concord this morning, we had a bill signing for House Bill 1269 that allows you can have veteran status on your, on your uh, driver's license. What that does is a lot of companies will offer you a veteran's discount, Lowe's, et cetera, et cetera. You have to prove you're a veteran. Prior to that, you had to have your DD-214, whatever. Now it'll be on your driver's license, you can take care of uh, the advantage of that. Um, as we continue to move forward in Concord, uh, I've been here, like I said, since 1978. I've been up there 10 years. I understand the problems in Bedford. I understand in the school systems, where our funding problems are. I understand what some of the money problems we have in the town. We have lost revenue sharing. We have lost rooms and meals tax. I think that as we go forward, those are the types of issues I would like to, to see taken care of. No offense to my opponent, but after for being here for 40 something days, I don't know that he knows the true issues in Bedford. I understand the building codes, the fire codes. We have to get rid of the mandates from DRA. They keep coming down with new mandates, the LLC tax, the campground tax, et cetera, et cetera. New fees all the time. They want to tax the internet. They want to tax this. They want to tax that. We have to rein those people in. DES has a problem with the shoreline protection. You can't build with, depending where you are, 100 feet, 150 feet, 200 feet within uh, a wetland in different communities. One of the problems that we have to f resolve is figuring out a way to stop the agencies from coming down with rules that affect us on a daily basis. And again, I'll go back to what I said before. We do not have a revenue problem in Concord, we have a spending problem, and we have to get common sense reasoning. I would really appreciate your vote on September 11th. Thank you. Thank you, Ken. Andy? Again, Kathy, thanks so much for having me. Ken, thanks for participating. All the staff at BCTV, you guys have been awesome. Thanks so much. And everyone listening today, it's just, it's been a great experience. You know, I also have to, have to thank Mr. Mr. Hawkins because he continues to bring up and compliment me on all this legislation that I passed and worked so hard to try and prove to the voters of New Hampshire. You know, many of you know I was the guy that led the charge against the LLC income tax. I led the charge against the campground tax, and we have a new campground tax that's going right now that I'm still fighting. You know, I'm a fourth generation native. I've lived in this state my entire life. I'm a small business owner. And a consideration I ask people to ask is, you know, do they want established politicians in office forever and ever? Or do they want someone with the energy and the leadership skills and has proven to be a problem solver to fix what's going on in our state? You know, one of the challenges we have looking forward is Senate District 9's changed real dramatically at, at, with this 10-year redistricting. It's not the Bedford District of Old where it was just, you know, we pick a Republican and we throw them in. You know, over on the Democratic side, you know, we have Jean Shaheen's husband's law partner, a trial attorney who wants to come in. And for me, I believe we need someone with that experience in the Senate. We need someone with the energy and the leadership in order to go in there and stand up for that. 
you know, the fight we're going to find in this, in this Senate race, and I, I really do hope you support me in the primary, it's going to be about small business owners who are struggling every single day to make it happen, going again, up against slip and fall attorneys who just want to craft the legislation by which to sue you with. You know, this is going to be a tough general election. And being in the Senate and someone who, who has such a strong financial background and, and frankly, again, is known as the real, the real frugal conservative of, of, of the state Senate, I believe I have those skills. You know, I also want to send a real shout out and compliment to the, the town council, who as most of you know, know last week, they picked a, two, a new town manager. You know, sure my opponent wants to talk about the fact how long I've specifically lived in Bedford, but at the end of the day, isn't it about the person who can best do the job? The town council did that. They worked real hard about trying to find someone to, to run this town. They looked at candidates who were from Bedford and candidates who were out of town and ultimately picked the best person for the job who had the best skill and had the best experience. I mean, that's what this is about. This is a job interview of finding someone who can win, not just in November, but can help lead our state and return to those traditional values of getting government to respect us and respect our money. You know, again, my name is Andy Sanborn. Uh, I would love to have your consideration of a vote. Please go to my website, which is andysanborn.com, and would love to answer your questions and, and come out and meet and have coffee with you. You know, I've banged on over 3,200 individual doors since I've started this campaign, more than any politician in this district ever has. I hear what the voters say, and they say, we want someone that can do the job. Thank you. Our debate is officially over. I want to thank you, Ken, for participating. Thank you. And I want to thank you, Andy, <laughs> thank as well, so for much. participating. I look forward to one of you returning here for a debate with your Democratic opponent after the uh, primary is over and prior to the November final election. This Tell It Like It Is show could absolutely not have happened without the advanced help of my co-producer, Jerry Benick, nor without the full participation and support of my director and cinematographer, Michael Currier of Castle Hill Media. Thanks for control room assistance and production to BCTV manager Bill Jennings and to assistant manager Colleen Richardson. I'd like to thank my floor crew today, Laurie Sanborn, Dave Gilbert, Mitch Tack, and Adam Strobel. And a very, very special thank you must go out to Steve Delahunty and Jim Delahunty of Lightfoot Clocks for their expert help today in providing and operating electronic timing devices. This debate has been taped and it will be rebroadcast on a regular BCTV Channel 16 weekly schedule. It will also be available as a video on demand on the BCTV website www.bedfordtv.com. Please do not forget to go out and vote on Tuesday, September 11th. This is a big election. Thank you for watching and until the next time, you keep on telling like it is. Bye bye and we're out. Set. <laughs> All right. Kenny, great, great job. Good. Thank you. You too.